Today, the FDA calls for a temporary halt in the administration of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine after six cases of a rare blood clotting disorder. We'll explain if this pause is expected to affect the U.S. vaccine rollout. Plus, restaurants are eager to welcome customers back into their dining rooms. Problem is, they can't find enough workers to accommodate the returning business. And finally, Bitcoin jumps to a record high as cryptocurrency exchange Coinbase prepares to go public tomorrow. I'm Pippa Stevens, and this is CNBC After Hours. Stocks traded mostly higher today, and the S&P 500 managed to hand in yet another record close, although the Dow Jones finished in negative territory. Dow component Johnson & Johnson fell about one and a third percent today after the FDA advised states to pause their use of that J&J &J vaccine after identifying a rare blood clot disorder in six women who received the shot. Regulators say the action was taken out of an abundance of caution, and Johnson & Johnson said in a statement that no causal relationship has been confirmed between the blood clots and the shot. More than two dozen states have heeded the FDA's advice and immediately stopped administering the J&J &J shot. We asked Meg Terrell to walk us through what this means for the pace of the vaccine rollout. So the FDA and CDC issued a joint statement this morning saying out of an abundance of caution, they are recommending pausing administration of the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine after a few cases of extremely rare but severe blood clots observed in people who had the vaccine. Now, what they said is that there's been almost 7 million shots administered of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, and they've seen six cases. But they are concerning enough that the government is saying, let's pause right now as we look more deeply into these cases, try to get a better sense of any of the risk profile of people who might have these rare blood clots uh, and figure out whether we need to make new recommendations for how the vaccine is used or even just to tell people to look out for this incredibly rare side effect. What they saw were that these six cases were in women. They were all women between the ages of 18 and 48. And they are saying that it's important that both people who've been vaccinated with the j, &J vaccine and also doctors know about this situation because these blood clots are different from normal blood clots. They say if anybody experiences within three weeks of getting the J&J &J shot, severe headache, shortness of breath, pain in the abdomen or the legs, uh, they should let their doctors know. Uh, but really, this is a pause as they look more deeply into this and we'll hear more from the CDC's advisors on these cases tomorrow, whether there are things that are similar about them, and they'll figure out how to proceed. We should also note that both Dr. Fauci as well as the FDA and CDC are emphasizing they have not seen any of this risk with the mRNA vaccines, either Pfizer or Moderna. Uh, this is only something they have seen with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine in the United States. The message from the White House right now is that there will be no impact to Americans' ability to get vaccinated as a result of the pause on the J&J &J vaccine. If you look at the numbers of vaccinations that have been given, J&J &J was about 7 million, whereas you had for Pfizer, 98 million shots administered were Pfizer shots, 85 million were Moderna shots, and in terms of the supply we expect to come, we expect there to be enough for 200 million people total by the end of May from just those two companies. And remember, they're, they're two-shot vaccines, and so each of those companies is delivering 200 million doses by the end of May, and an additional 100 million more from each of them by the end of July. There's certainly a concern that uh, headlines about a safety risk like this might affect hesitancy in terms of people wanting to get the vaccine. But taken the other way, and this was the message from Dr. Fauci and Jeff Zients, uh, it's that the FDA and CDC move incredibly quickly after only six cases of something like this to say they're going to pause and look more deeply into it. And so uh, one could look at this situation as a reminder about the safety uh, mechanisms that are in place for uh, vaccines in this country. And so I think there's a hope among uh, many in the public health field that this will actually increase people's confidence in vaccines, knowing that the regulators are watching so closely. Okay, let's get to our sound check. Here's a roundup of the day's biggest action and what the top newsmakers and business leaders had to say on CNBC's airwaves. Wells Fargo is actually relatively cheap uh, heading into the earnings event, and we've seen a lot of bullish options activity both in Wells Fargo as well as Bank of America and overall in uh, XLF2.
we're doing everything we can. There's a high sense of urgency throughout this, the ecosystem and supply chain from equipment manufacturers to manufacturers like Tom Caulfield to create capacity. We're all with a high sense of urgency to get the most out of the existing capacity we have now, accelerating investments to create new capacity. We've been thinking about going IPO for a year now, and we said, what is the best way? And we found this was a better way to IPO. And specifically, Brad, who you know, Altimeter, they've just been a great partner. I think the Coinbase IPO, uh, following our own IPO at CoinShares last month, which was exciting. But this one really, you know, valuation right now is looking not just 90 billion, which I think is the number Leslie gave. In private markets, we're looking at 147 billion right now, which makes Coinbase bigger than Goldman Sachs. That is my target for the end of this week. Let's see if they do it. All right, after a brutal year marked by lockdowns and in some cases, ever-changing capacity restrictions, restaurants are seeing diners and business rebound. But even as unemployment remains higher than pre-pandemic levels, restaurants can't find enough people to hire. Major chains are holding splashy hiring events in an attempt to bring more people on board. Kate Rogers can explain. As consumers are starting to dine out again, restaurants around the country are running into a new problem. There aren't enough workers to go around. Some franchisees like Daniel Halpern, who owns several TJI Fridays across the country, say they're out looking for workers, but finding it challenging. We're constantly trying to staff. It, it's the number one issue on all our calls with all our general managers, director of operations, COO, myself is, it, it, you know, how do we get people to come back? And really within reason offering money isn't doing it because people are incentivized to stay home and collect money through the stimulus. To incentivize workers, he says he's looking beyond just comprehensive benefits and considering things like access to tip money same day via debit cards. The National Federation of Independent Business says the challenge of finding qualified workers is starting to weigh on small business owners. While sentiment overall increased in March, 51% of owners reported few or no qualified workers. Now, what's more, 42% of all owners reported job openings that they couldn't fill. That's a record high reading, 20 points higher than the group's historical average over the last 48 years of 22%. Parent companies also announcing events to help find workers for some of their franchisees. Today, McDonald's will kick off a three-day hiring event in Texas to fill 25,000 roles across the state. Later this month, Taco Bell says it's going to have hiring parties at 2,000 locations to bring on 5,000 workers, and IHOP also announced it's looking to hire 10,000 workers. Now, the summer typically brings about a hiring boost for the industry, but this time around, it's coinciding with stimulus, and restaurants say that that's a double-edged sword because consumers, of course, have more money to spend, more money in their pockets, which is always a good thing for restaurants and retailers. But on the flip side, some say enhanced unemployment benefits may be incentivizing workers to stay home a bit longer. Okay, time for the numbers round. So let's kick it off with 9.1. Gasoline prices surged 9.1% higher in March, illustrating the rising cost of consumer goods in America. The U.S. Consumer Price Index, which is an economic metric that tracks prices over time, just registered its highest year-over-year -year increase in two and a half years. These rising prices come amid mounting worries about inflation as the country's economic recovery starts to accelerate. That being said, many economists and policymakers at the Federal Reserve expect the increase to be temporary. Next, $8.4 billion. Earlier today, Apple announced a new product event later this month, where it's expected to announce a new version of its iPad Pro, along with other updated devices. iPads have been hugely successful for Apple throughout the pandemic. For the company's first fiscal quarter, which took place over the last three months of 2020, Apple reported more than $8.4 billion in iPad revenue alone. That's a 41% increase from the same quarter the previous year. The new iPad Pros expected to be unveiled on April 20th are rumored to include Apple's newest and fastest processors. And finally, 63000 The price of Bitcoin hit a new all-time high above $63,000 as investors await the hotly anticipated stock market debut of cryptocurrency exchange 
Coinbase. The company will go public tomorrow in a direct listing on the Nasdaq that could value the firm at as much as $100 billion. That's astounding. As we said earlier, Coinbase is an exchange where people buy and sell Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Well, the Intercontinental Exchange, which owns the New York Stock Exchange, is only valued around $67 billion. The size of the Coinbase deal reflects the interest in the space, even from investors outside the crypto community. We'll have minute-by-minute -minute coverage of the direct listing tomorrow on CNBC.com and on the CNBC app. That's it for After Hours. We'll be back here in our home office every Tuesday and Thursday, so be sure to catch us then.